let's see. I'm not sure if I'm streaming right now. Yeah, yeah, okay. It just pulled up for let's me. See. Not sure if I'm streaming right now. Yeah, yeah, okay. It just pulled up for me. Okay, well, uh, yeah, hi everyone that's here. Uh, I'm Jerry. I'm the head tutor for Signal okay. Systems here. Yeah, so how this works is that I'm going to be giving my presentation over YouTube. But uh, if you want to come and join me uh, just to ask questions live, I'm sitting in the the IEEE like tutoring Discord. Yeah, I'm sitting in tutoring room one, so if you want to come and ask questions there, uh, I'm, I'm available. I'm, I'm muting my mic over there just so that uh, everything stays consistent with the YouTube stream, because that's the main target that I'm going for. So, yeah, hey, we're going to talk a bit about signals and systems today, because I know your exam is either tomorrow or coming up. So, yeah, uh, I'll be like one second, and we'll go ahead and get started with the content. Also, also, um, I should have posted the uh, notes that I have. Yeah, I posted them on my GitHub page. So I think that that shows up at the uh, YouTube chat, but I'm not sure if that's working correctly. So I'm going to go ahead and just post that in the Discord for right now. And whenever the comment section opens up on YouTube, I'll post that there too. So let's see. Uh, tutoring. Yeah, it's in the tutoring channel if anyone's looking at that. Yeah, so, uh, any any other announcements? Uh, oh yeah, also there's a IEEE meeting after this one, so if you want to go ahead and know what everyone is going to be up to, yeah, you know, for the rest of the semester, I guess, uh, yeah, go ahead and pop over there after this meeting. Yeah, but, let's see, it should be showing my uh, yeah, slides right now. So yeah, this is exam two for signals and systems. Uh, so the main topic of this is like Fourier analysis, so Fourier series, Fourier transforms and the like. And yeah, so I have a bit of an outline here. So we're gonna talk about Fourier analysis and we're going to go into the math eventually, but I, I really just kind of want to instill the, the idea that this stuff isn't as scary as it might look in its full abstraction that it's like presented it in class and like in the book. So like, I'm going to go into a bit of my, my musings on that. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the frequency domain in general, uh, specifically the magnitude and phase spectrums, because those are the important ones really. I'm also going to talk a bit about uh, yeah, the Fourier transform, Fourier series, I'm going to compare them a bit. And also we're going to just start going into solving some problems after that. So, yeah, what I'm talking about here is Fourier analysis. So, like, there's a lot of math, there's a bunch of sums, there's a bunch of integrals. And these things can kind of look a bit scary. But, uh, the... In our, in our experience as, as, as like humans, I guess, like we, we talk about these ideas just colloquially like, among each other, like without even knowing that they might be related to these things. So con consider like whenever you talk about sound. So what, what is sound? Sound is like whenever these little sound pressure waves hit our eardrums and these, it, it makes our eardrum vibrate and then our brain interprets this vibration signal and it gives us something that we can talk about. It will we'll say like things are high pitched, low pitched, high frequency, low frequency. We might say like the bass really pops on this one song, like that it's saying like the low frequencies are good. <laughs> we can talk about amplitude, things being loud and quiet and stuff. So 
what Fourier analysis does is that it lets us talk about these ideas a bit more quantitatively. Like we already have the language to talk about them a lot of times, at least qualitatively. But um, through like the magnitude and phase spectrums, we can talk about these things uh, more precisely, like with mathematics, and we could build cool things without really stretching our language too much. So, yeah, that that that's my idea about Fourier analysis. Uh, that what what I just want to talk about with this is that they're they're kind of intuitive ideas once you get down to the root of them. So, yeah. So. On the magnitude and phase spectrum, so yeah, we have the magnitude spectrum a lot of times. Um, so what that typically tells you is like how loud certain frequencies are in like a signal. Remember that we can decompose a signal into just a sum of like sinusoids. So yeah, that that whole uh, we can characterize all of those sinusoids through their magnitude and their phase as evidenced by like the Fourier series you've learned in class. So what I want to tell you about the magnitude spectrum is it it tells you how loud each individual frequency in that decomposition is. So like if we have uh, let me see if I can write here. Okay. Yeah, so like if we have like the Fourier series of, of something or the Fourier transform, all it's saying is that, well, this frequency that's at uh, that at one, it's it's zero. It's this frequency that's at one point five. It's like it has a loudness of point five. This frequency that's at three it has a zero. Yeah, if we have like some Fourier transform that looks like this, so like, yeah, magnitude spectrum is amplitude. Okay. Yeah, so um, important notions, it's always going to be non-negative when we talk about the magnitude spectrum, so everything's going to be above the x-axis. So like, and also uh, for, for real signals, which are typically what we'll be interested in, unless you're in some subfields of engineering, but for the most part we'll be talking about real signals. So just because like we, we like talking about rep, like real numbers, um, we, they're easy to, to work with. They're, they're typically easier to work with. So like, they exhibit something called conjugate symmetry. So what this means is that for the magnitude spectrum, these two sides are going to look the same. Like, if you were to flip them across the y-axis, like, these two would be the same. Like, like, the left and the right sides would be the same. So, yeah, in other words, uh, the magnitude spectrum is an even function you can flip it back and forth. So, let's see. Yeah, so the, the idea of bandwidth also comes from the, the magnitude spectrum. So, like, remember that we when we have a system, it's something that operates on a signal. So, like, if we just have some system, what we can do, since, like, we assume that all of our systems are LTI, the, those three properties that we went over in like the last exam. Since things are LTI here, we can characterize a system completely by its impulse response. So like by its magnitude and phase spectrum. So like that's all the behavior. LTI basically means that different frequencies won't change the behavior of other frequencies. So like all of these x values are independent of each other. So like basically what that means is that we can characterize any behavior that we could want to design through by just specifying it with the impulse response of our system. So what that means is like if we have like a uh, if we have some system we can feed in like an impulse response and once we put in that impulse response which is just the that that spike at zero whatever we get out of that will completely characterize our system yeah, so that will be a function of time, but like, and th this function of time could be like anything. It could be like a bunch of waves, or like, uh, I don't know, like a bunch of boxes for some reason. It could really be any general function. But like, the cool thing about Fourier analysis is that it lets us talk about these things with 
more interpretability. Like it's easier to talk about these systems with their Fourier domain counterpart. So yeah, talking about them in the Fourier domain is typically more intuitive. So uh, there's there's also this notion. So whenever we're designing systems, uh, we'll, we'll typically specify like a certain number, like say the bandwidth. So like bandwidth could be like wherever like this drops 3 dB from the maximum point. So like whatever that is is our, our bandwidth. So like typically there's two different notions. So sometimes like people might have different definitions of bandwidth depending on which domain that you're working in. So for baseband signals like this sync function right here, um, we we'll typically call the bandwidth the like the half width. So like whatever is on this right side, it's like uh, I work with audio and sound a lot of times. So like we we know that the bandwidth of our our ear our hearing range is is twenty kilohertz. Yeah. So like that would be like on the x axis twenty k. So like. The, the bandwidth wouldn't be like this whole thing from negative 20 to 20k. No one says that we have a bandwidth of 40k hertz. It's just this right side. This is what we're interested in, like my domain specifically. Um, for, different, for different domains that might uh, not necessarily be at the baseband, so being at the baseband meaning that it's going to be like distributed very close to the y-axis, that y is equal to zero, that or x is equal to zero. So like, if we have like, a, if we have some like, domain that works outside of the baseband, so like, it's maybe way out here at like 100 megahertz or something, 1m, or this one is also a 1m, like, this is what I would call a, a, not a baseband signal, but a passband signal. And when they talk about bandwidth, a lot of times they'll be talking about the whole width here. So like it's everything encompassing. Like so, this right side to this right, this left side, is the whole bandwidth. So yeah, the, there's different notions of it. So it, if you go into your further courses and it seems confusing, that's because like uh, people kind of redefine it based on what they think is more useful. So yeah, just something for the future. Right, so uh, what I want to talk about the phase spectrum. So like, when we're designing systems a lot of times, uh, the phase spectrum is admittedly less important a lot of times, but it's still important in that it tells us how frequencies will interact with each other, especially if you're adding them. Like, so if we have like, like two signals like x and y like then if we add those two depending on like how the phase spectrum looks we could have wildly different results like at like the output like maybe when we just add them together like if we have like a system where we've like like something with a block diagram that has like an addition sign like this this could give you wildly different results if like the phase spectrum is like not specified. So a lot of times, uh, so w one one thing that I like to show is that like if we have like sinusoids, then if we can uh, like depending on their phase, it will either add or cancel. Like it, it might have been called like additive synthesis or subtractive synthesis, not subtractive. Uh, there was a word for it. Mm, it kind of escapes me right now. But like, the point is like, either the the sinusoids will add or subtract. Let me try and pull up my problem tab real quick. Uh, let's see. It should be on Chrome. Yeah, cool. So this is on Chrome. So this is just a graphing calculator right here. So, like, what if we had so what if we just had some cosine? Now, uh, what if we're adding a cosine to it? So like, what if I add the exact same thing? So cosine x plus cosine x. 
So wait, hold on, it was at 1 before, but now we're at 2 after adding it. So, but what happens if this cosine that we're adding doesn't have the same phase as this one, the, the first one that we have? Like, what if we add a phase offset? Like, so let's try, uh, like, A, like, just some value, and I'm going to restrict it from pi over 2 to negative pi over 2. And, like, just because that's how our phase spectrum is typically bounded based on, like, the arctan function. So, yeah, notice how, like, it can either, like, rise or increase or decrease depending on the phase. Let me, let me increase this bound real quick. Let's go to pi. Yeah, so notice if we have, like, the phase set all the way to pi, things completely cancel out. So, and this would be represented on the phase spectrum. So notice how adding these things can either completely destroy information or they can amplify it. So that's, that's what I want to say about how signals interact. So like, going back to the slideshow here, Right, right. So, yeah, like I said, it's it has a bounded range. It's from negative pi to pi. Yeah, so, so like, that that basically just comes from us like wanting to characterize how things will interact whenever like the time delay is such that like the the period of it, such that it's within like one period of like a, a sinusoid. So like, and like, yeah, so that demonstration was to show that it, like frequencies will interact with each other depending, like how they interact depends on the phase spectrum. And so again, for real signals, uh, it a similar thing happens with the magnitude spectrum, uh, that conjugate symmetry thing. So like, what that's going to mean is that it's an odd function, basically. It's so like if we were to like reflect like across like that like y equals x line or x equals ne w negative y line. So like the, these two, yeah, it's like we we would have like the same function if we were to like kind of look at it across those lines. So. Yeah, uh, and like I said before, the the magnitude spectrum is typically the one that we'll care about more whenever we're designing systems, but uh, that doesn't mean that we should neglect the phase spectrum, especially not in this class, since that's one of the topics. Uh, yeah, so, right, a, a few other facts about just the, the frequency domain and representations so like if we have like an odd function then if we have like an odd real signal then we'll have like something that's purely imaginary so like that would mean like the real part is equal to zero and like if we have like an even function in the time domain then we would have something that has like purely imaginary, that's purely real. So that would mean that the imaginary part is equal to zero. Yeah, and for some reason it doesn't write well. I need to try and figure that out eventually. Yeah, so like, yeah, that, this kind of brings us to the Fourier transform. Uh, I'm gonna, at this point I'm gonna go ahead and try and see if anyone's in. Yeah, so Anyone that's in the Discord right now, um, is is all this making sense? Uh, is is there any questions so far before we start getting into like the math? Well, yeah, uh, no questions as it seems. So I'm gonna go ahead and start talking about. The seems course. to make sense. Okay, great, great. I appreciate the feedback. <laughs> Yeah, so like, 
we got the Fourier transform. So like, what what that means is so what the Fourier transform is is like that's how we get to the magnitude and phase spectrum of our our signal or our systems in pulse response. Like, that's so like it has a few properties. It satisfies it. It satisfies the LTI criterion, like linear time invariant. Yeah. But also it it's invertible. So what that means is that we can go back and forth, like with this being the forward transform, the top one, and this one being the reverse transform, the inverse. So like this this will take us to and from the frequency domain. So like uh yeah, it's defined in terms of an integral, but a lot of times uh, we're, we're not going to think of our systems in terms of this. Not not typically. What we'll have is some real function, so it could be some piece of data, like, a, like it could be an analytic function, like f of x is equal to x squared, like some polynomial maybe. But what it also could be is maybe like a list of numbers. Like we'll typically see that in like discrete signals. Um, it, it could be like just it, it could be like a, like a boxes or pictures that like you're, you're given and like these will typically be defined in terms of real numbers and like so we'll feed those real numbers into something that can perform this transform it could be a calculator it could be your computer it could be MATLAB it could be you I mean it's going to be you especially on the system so yeah, this is something to note. Um, how to do so? Like, it'll transform it into a complex number, so a, a complex function of, of frequency. So, we remember that we have like two different types of two different representations typically for complex numbers. Like, remember we have like the Cartesian form, which is like it has the the real and imaginary part like that a plus jb form that you might be familiar with from high school but this this form this is kind of second to the the exponential form of a complex number like defined in terms of like the magnitude and phase yeah the phase magnitude and like these are really the important ones that i i just spent uh a few minutes talking about these are these are what I'm talking about so like this magnitude remember that like the magnitude of something is just going to be like the the Euclidean distance like so like so the real part plus the imaginary part squared yeah and like that's our magnitude spectrum and like this one is going to be like some angle so you might have it be like the arc tangent of like y over x so like but I, I wouldn't pay too much attention to this formula it, but yeah so we have the magnitude and phase spectrums and I, I just told you all why in, in a lot of parts of engineering these are two of the most important ideas that we have so like yeah so we got so from the Fourier transform, uh, it, it simplifies a lot of things for us. So y'all remember from the first exam that convolution kind of sucks. So like uh, the the convolution theorem tells us that m convolution in the time domain is equivalent to multiplication in the frequency domain. So what this means is that any like signal that we had before. Any time that we had like signals before, and we had to convolve them. Remember that whenever we have like like a system defined in terms of like a block diagram, like if we're to like pass a function, like say x, into like our system h, this would be the convolution of these two. So x conv convolved with h, yeah, convolved with h where h is like the impulse response. So like, if we have the Fourier transform, we can we can uh, use like the, those properties of linearity and like time, time invariance and 
we what we get is that our block diagrams will stay the same whenever we take the Fourier transform. So like, it, it will have like a time domain x, we'll have the frequency domain x right here, and this has the equivalent structure with like the frequency domain impulse, yeah, the, the frequency response of our time domain impulse function, our time domain impulse response. So like, yeah, this system would have an output of x times h, and we like multiplication. Multiplication tends to be a bit nicer to do. So like, yeah, the, and like we have a, a similar thing with in the in the frequency domain due to something called duality. So like, results that we have for like the forward transform, the will we'll typically like end up having something similar for the inverse transform. So like, if we go from time domain and we're evolving, we'll get multiplicating, yeah, multiplying, multiplicating, multiplying in the frequency domain. But if we have convolution in the frequency domain, we'll actually get multiplication in the time domain. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and make, I'll, I'll try and get you some examples where this would come in handy, but this is also something that's, that's useful. So like, yeah, we, we talked a bit about what is convolution, and I really tried to hammer in like why uh, convolution and the frequency domain is, is they're, they're inherently linked through that duality, like that convolution theorem. So what we have now is a few properties that we'll have that will kind of help us solving problems, like, especially when we want to like describe the behavior of some system that was say just like a modification of one that we've already seen before so like if we have like a time shift so if we have like x t plus tau where tau is just some real number what this means is that we'll get in the frequency domain we'll just multiply it by this complex exponential so like and it, it's a function of frequency, but it has a constant tau there. Yeah, so that's just the amount that's shifted over. So, like, what this means is that when we have some... When we have, like, a function that's in the time domain that's shifted over, like some... So, like, if we have a function... I'm going to make a box. I like boxes. I'm going to draw a lot of boxes for you. So, like, if we have, like, this box... And then we shift it over, like say to, I'm gonna call this tau now. So like, what if this has like the Fourier transform? Remember that the Fourier transform of a box is like a sinks function. Yeah. So if we have like, so from this identity, we can say that the Fourier transform now is like, like an e, like this exponential term j omega t j omega tau times like this is sink of like whatever this box is so like what this will do is like if we have like the magnitude spectrum then the magnitude spectrum will be completely the same but oh wait yeah remember this like a sink function yeah so it's like uh, should be above x-axis, so it look more like that. Yeah, something like that. But the phase spectrum will be changed, and this frequency, that this multiplication by a complex exponential, this has the effect of like shifting it, like kind of turning it sideways. So like if we had just, so if we had like a magnitude spectrum, if we had a phase spectrum that was say like a straight line before. What we'd have after this time delay is something that's like slanted. So that's something to keep in mind. So we got time shifting. So for time scaling, what what that means is like remember that if we have like some like I'm gonna draw another box again. So if we have box, if we were to scale it in time, 
if we're to stretch it, like stretching means that a is like so it's less than one and like greater than zero. So like if we were to stretch it out, then it would be wide in the time domain. Uh, yeah, yeah, it would be much wider in the time domain, and like what this would give us in the frequency domain is uh, exactly the opposite actually though. So like if we have the frequency domain representation then this would be, so if our original function is async that looks something like this, then what we'll get from the timescaling is something that is like squished down so it'll be more localized in frequency so what that means is like it, it'll have like the same range values but like it'll be like more squished it'll be more compressed notice that this one's like wider than this one so like yeah that it's like stretching will give us something that is squished in the frequency domain and squishing it so like making it like thinner in the time domain will make it stretch out so like it'll be a lot wider in the frequency domain so like yeah that's what we've got for time scaling also um, don't forget this multiplying constant of like that has that's like the reciprocal of our scaling factor like what this gives what that'll do is just make sure the area is the same under both of these they have the same they'll have the same area so like and then yeah we from the Fourier transform we'll get linearity too so like if we were to take the Fourier transform of like this ax plus by term then like we can take out our constant and then we can distribute across this this plus sign so it's like we'd have two Fourier transforms we can take out the constant there again and then we'd get our freq we can get our frequency domain representation uh, assuming we know like the Fourier transform of like x and y so uh, what this tells us is I, I, I kind of touched on it in a, a few slides back, but what this tells us is that um, any any like system that we have like def defined in terms of like a block diagram is like it'll remain like the same. It'll have the same structure if we have it in the time or frequency domain. So it really doesn't matter how we specify what our system is going to do what but like if we we're to interpret it either in the time domain in the or in the frequency domain like it doesn't matter it's going to give us the this it's going to have the same structure in our block diagram and i think that's like the the idea behind like linearity basically so like yeah, you. This might be and this might be useful if you're like looking at a block diagram. So, yeah, uh, we got linearity, and uh, yeah, then we got. I, I'm going to talk a bit about Parseval's theorem here. So, Parseval's theorem basically says that energy is unitary. So, what that means is, uh, so if we have energy in the time domain will have a corresponding unit of energy in the frequency domain. It's like these two will be off by like just this scalar factor. And how, how does that happen? Oh, um, well, the, the way I like to think about it is in, in terms of something like, like money. Like, let's, let's say our, like, our, our time domain is like, it's like USD, like we have US dollars. And it's like, if we go to like a different country, and like like we say say we're going to Canada, 
Um, if we were to go to Canada and take this USD with us, we would convert it over into like Canadian dollars. Yeah, cat cat. Ooh, wow, got Canadian money now. So like, even though we have a certain amount of money in the U.S., this is an equivalent amount of money in the over the over in Canada. So like, what this tells us is that these two, no matter in what uh, domain that we're in, we still have the same amount of money. Like, no matter where we are, we could go back and forth. I mean like modulo some like domain like some exchange rate stuff that I'm not going to get into but oh well so like energy is unitary things in the time domain energy in the time domain will correspond to a block of energy in the frequency domain and vice versa you could maybe think of it in terms of like time units it that's what allows us to assign like units to things a lot of times so like yeah we got Time shifting, time scaling. I talked a bit about Parseval's theorem and linearity. So, what we got now, and I know that in Fumagalli's class, this is a bit. It, he he likes to stress this. So, if we define systems in terms of like derivatives, then we actually have like a a nice little identity for the frequency domain. Uh, of like that time domain derivative. So like if we were to take the derivative of some signal then the Fourier transform now will just be some some multiplication by this j omega term. So whenever we have n derivatives we'll get an exponent of n. And like if we have yeah so if n is like some integer Basically, so if we know the time, if we know the frequency domain representation of this one, you know this x j omega, then we know the frequency domain representation of all of its derivatives, because we can just tack on this extra term. So, like, we get a corresponding result for integrals also. So, like, this is just a single integral, but Notice the bounds from negative infinity to positive infinity, or negative infinity to t. So, like, um, notice that, like, in the, if we, like, take an integral now, the frequency domain representation is going to be, like, this, a, a similar multiplication, like, by a j omega term. Now it's just the inverse, like, j omega negative 1 j omega to the negative one, right? Just, just simple algebra. So like, algebra. So like, yeah, we got this, but this integral doesn't. Somewhere in our integrals, like when we ever, when we like take, change our basis from like the time domain to the frequency domain, then we'll have to tack on this term that accounts for the DC value. So this is something that can this will just produce another like spike at zero. Well that'll kinda correspond to like the the energy. The 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 total like DC energy of the the signal. So we got definitions in terms of integrals and derivatives. And like something that might also be useful is like if we like due to because of duality we have something similar for derivatives in terms of the frequency domain. So like if we have like a multiplication of our time variable like with our signal, so that'll just give us the derivative of our function. The derivative of, in frequency of our frequency domain representation like multiplied by like, this j term all this does is change the phase. The magnitude spectrum will be the same. The phase spectrum will, it'll be like, you'll, you'll shift it like up and down depending on like the, the j values. This is just, you shift it up by like 2 pi or pi over 2. Right, so from there, um, 
I, li I like talking about the Fourier transform first, just because at the end of the day, the Fourier series and Fourier transforms are really encode the same idea. We're still just decomposing like, uh, some signal into sines and cosines. Where just like that, the Fourier transform uses like it could be possibly uncountably infinite uh, number of frequencies. So like it would be like a continuum of frequencies. A Fourier series is really just where we have like a certain discrete set of frequencies that we're interested in, and those are those are, are the harmonics of like the fundamental frequency. Yeah, and so just some n times omega, like all of these are just some multiple of this fundamental frequency, which is going to be the the term two times the period over no wait two pi over the period. Sorry, sorry. So like yeah, and uh. I, I want to stress Euler's formula just because, like, uh, this this is really what connects this decomposition into sines and cosines that we keep talking about. The complex exponential is really a periodic function, also through Euler's formula. Like, and we'll whenever we use this complex exponential instead of sines and cosines. Uh, our notation gets a lot easier a lot of times, so you know we'll we'll see that in the different forms for Fourier series. But uh, in, in my experience, it's always been easier to work with like the the complex exponential than like the sines and cosines. Right. So yeah, we got a bunch of different ways of writing Fourier series. Yeah. So. Remember Fourier series is just this idea of decomposing a signal into sines and cosines, or like a, a complex exponential. Yeah, so like we have the exponential form, so it's just where we're, we represent it in terms of the, the complex exponential. So like this would be x times, uh, so we represent it with a coefficient like some complex coefficient, and then we get a bunch of uh, complex exponentials, and that's the exponential form. We got the trig form, which is we got like a DC term here. So this basically tells us like what the average energy of like our, our signal is like. So if we had like something that looks like this, the DC term would just be like the average of all of these values. So that would be our a zero, and like then we got the the higher harmonics, which are given by the a n cosine and the b n sine terms. And another representation that we can draw from this is a uh, instead of using like the exponential form for real signals, we can. We can represent it not in terms of, we can forego this complex exponential if you really don't like complex numbers in favor of like this cosine term. So like similarly to the trig form, like this C0, this big C0 is going to be like that, the average term, the DC term. And like notice this compact form has both the phase and like a coefficient in front. So. Yeah, the, those are the three forms that we'll typically talk about whenever we're saying Fourier series. But uh, I, I really want to stress that all of these are equivalent. They're, there's not really too much difference between them. It's just that whatever suits our purposes for the math is really why we use different forms, I guess. I don't really technically consider them separate forms. Like It's just these Euler's formula. So like, um, so we know how to like represent a signal in terms of like a four like its Fourier coefficients and like whatever form that we have. So like, how do we get those coefficients? So uh, I, what I want to stress here is that 
we don't want to be doing integrals if we can. Like, if you have cosines or sines in the, the function, just turn them into like a complex exponential and use the exponential form. Like, that, that would really simplify your, your life. Uh, at least that's how it is for me. Um, just because, like, we can kind of look at things in terms, we can kind of get the coefficients by inspection for those frequencies, like, so we got, yeah, and it's like, once we get it into an exponential form, we can turn it into whatever form that we'll want to be talking about, like, for a problem, so like, if we have like, the exponential form, and then we'll have like, the trig form, like we could use this identity. If we have the exponential form and we want to get the trig form, we could just use these identities. And if we have the if we have like a the exponential form again, just because like I think that that's the easiest one to work with, we'll have these identities to get the compact form coefficient. So like this angle symbol just means that we're we're going to get the, the angle of our complex number. Yeah, so like, uh, yeah, it's just like that, that angle there. Like that, that might be the phase information. Yeah. So like, we got Fourier series coefficients, and if you really have to do the integrals for getting the coefficients, uh, like these are the formulas that you'll use like right here for the exponential form and for the trig form yeah your a n and b n are given there but uh, what I want to stress is that you you don't want to be using these formulas whenever possible also uh, if you remember like like these uh, like cosine squared and sine squared identities they're, they're kind of They'd be helpful for the cases that you will probably need to use these integral formulas. So, like, uh, expen like some examples of things that you'll probably need to pull out these formulas for are, like, if you're given like a periodic function, like a triangle wave or a square wave, so a triangle wave or a square wave or a, a sawtooth, I like. To Call it, yeah. So like, all of these, um, they're going to be defined in terms of like a linear function. So like, you'll have like a t term, a t term here, over here. All of those will have like some t behavior times like some constant plus like some bias. And like, we can use these identities to get what we want. So like, uh, like I've been trying to stress here. The Fourier series and Fourier transform really capture similar ideas. They're just trying to represent a like something that could look really wild, a bunch of wavies. Uh, uh, if it might not necessarily be a single one, it could be like a a mixture of them. And what we want to do is represent it with something that's more interpretable, like maybe like just a set of spikes in the time domain, like, or not the time domain, the frequency domain. Yeah, so like, and this, if we don't have like a function for this one, it might be more clear, like, to talk about the behaviors of like these two. Just a thought. So like, we got all that. So like, for one thing that you need to remember is that the Fourier series is for periodic signals. So basically if you can take some part of it and then repeat it a bunch, so like in the sawtooth, notice that this one is the same as this one, which is the same as this one on the right, which will be the same as all of these. If we can make it periodic, if it's periodic, the signal that we're given, then we'll want to represent it with a Fourier series. Whereas, if we have a an aperiodic signal, like if we just had like some box, then we'd want to use the Fourier transform. This is 
Fourier transform. And remember that if we have something that's periodic, then we'll want to use Fourier series. And like, whenever we have the, the Fourier series, if we were to represent that in the frequency domain, it would just be a bunch of spikes. And if we have the Fourier transform, it'll be continuous in the frequency domain. Like, both the magnitude and the phase spectrum will have a... Yeah, it, it'll... they'll both be continuous functions. And they won't be spikes, basically. So, yeah, the... So, at this point, is like, uh, when we're... I'm going to get into solving some problems pretty soon. But, um... Yeah, the way we that, that we do that, usually, is that in order to make things easy on us, because like, we like easy things, we want to avoid doing integrals, is that um, we'll know a bunch of, like, common Fourier transforms, like, like, a bunch of common functions that we can represent our system in terms of, and the Fourier transform correspondingly, and we'll just use, like, a table of these, like, just a bunch of them that we know, and then we can kind of compose them together, like, add them, subtract them, multiply them together, it's like, and that's how we'll get our desired behavior. So, like, a few that are important are the complex exponential, so, like, if we have, like, say, so if we have a complex exponential, and this will give us uh, just a spike in the frequency domain. This will just give us one spike, the complex exponential. So for the, the cosine and sine terms uh, that you get, re like remember those formulas for cosine and sine? Like the, remember that cosine, cosine omega naught t is equal to one half. Uh, it's one, one half. Yeah, e to the j omega naught t plus one half e to the j omega naught e to the negative j omega naught t. So like, yeah, it's being screwed with my writing right now, but uh, the I'll, I'll probably write this again once we start doing examples. So like, the the picture that I wanna like really press is that if we have a cosine in the time domain, then like what we'll have is two spikes in the frequency domain. So like, in the if this was the magnitude spectrum, so this is magnitude. Yeah, so the magnitude spectrum of our cosine, then it'll just be two spikes that are pointing straight up at yeah omega plus minus omega. So like, and also the the phase spectrum of this one will be zero all the way across. But for the sine, this would be a little different. This phase spectrum would be would be a little different than the cosine term. Like, we'll have, if we have like a sine, so like, yeah, we got a sine, then same thing as before, we'll get two spikes in the frequency, in the magnitude spectrum, we'll get two spikes at omega and omega naught, yeah, plus minus omega, so this is the magnitude spectrum, but the phase spectrum will have two spikes, whereas for the cosine term, remember that we had no spikes in the phase spectrum. So like, we'll have, and these will be at pi over 2. The 2 minus pi over 2. And like, this is something to, yeah, this comes from like that, the idea that a sine is just a phase shifted cosine. So like, remember that, uh, like sine, 
sine of t is equal to uh, a cosine of t cosine of t plus uh, pi over 2, I believe. Uh, you might want to check up on this identity, uh, but the, the idea is here. It just comes from the idea that a sine is just a phase shifted cosine. It's a delayed cosine. So like, after that we got a rectangle function, so what this means is that the unit rectangle, the unit being like having a, an area of one, so like it'll be bounded from one half to negative one half, and it'll have value of one all the way across. So like this gives us a sync function. So and like we can get an idea of the zeros for this sync function. It's like they'll appear at integer or multiples of the fundamental frequency. Yeah, two yeah. Wait. Wait, I messed up. So they would be at integer at just the integers for this one, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this one the first zero would be at one, second one would be at two third would be at 3. I uh, drew them better on this side, so like this is negative, negative 1 here, negative 2 there, uh, negative 3, and so on. So remember that boxes give us sync functions, yeah. rectangles give us sync functions, and there is another one. Yeah, so this is kind of counterintuitive, but if we have a time domain delta function, so just a spike that's at zero, so it's one for when it's equal to zero, for when t is equal to zero, whatever's inside here is equal to zero, and then it's zero when it's not equal to zero, t is not equal to zero. So like, that's our delta function. Remember that just a single delta will give us something that is flat all the way across. It's, it's a constant value. It's just value of 1 in the frequency domain. Yeah, this is, if this was the magnitude spectrum, this would just have, a, this would be the magnitude spectrum, but the phase spectrum would be 0, since there's no j or complex exponential form. There, there's no complex exponentials in this Fourier transform. So like this would be the magnitude spectrum and then the phase spectrum would just be zero. So that's the Fourier transform of a delta function. But uh, this is kind of unintuitive and it's something that you might have to memorize. But like if we have a a, a pulse train, so a bunch of delta functions laid out in a periodic manner in the time domain. Remember that they have to be periodic, so like all of these spaces have to be tau. Yeah, so like all of these are tau. But if we have that, then we'd get a pulse train in the frequency domain also. This is kind of unintuitive, so it's something to memorize. But it would also be periodic in the frequency domain, like with, like just reciprocal of this frequency. So this would be 1 over tau, that distance. And all of those would have the same thing. So yeah, this is something to remember. Um, this is called the a pulse train, or a sampling function, or a, a Shaw function. Uh, all of those are referred to the same thing, and uh, I'm just kind of spitting those at you just for future reference. So like, yeah, we, we've come to the point where I'm going to start solving some examples now. Uh, yeah, so does anyone have any like specific problems that they want me to cover? Like I know that Fumagalli posts 
some of his past exam problems. But like, uh, yeah, Kuburu, he doesn't really make too many things public. But like, I remember taking his course, so yeah, uh, I, I remember him focusing on very similar things to Fumagalli's course. So yeah, we got some examples. Is there any ones that y'all wanted me to do, like specifically? Like, any requests? This time's for y'all. So, like, uh, if y'all have any, like, suggestions, uh, try posting those in the whiteboard section of the IEEE Discord. I'm gonna take, like, a, a two minute break and I'll be right back. Okay, so, right, uh, I see something, yeah, so we got, yeah, so from Fumagalli's examples, I'm going to go ahead and try and cover, okay, so I see one where we're taking the Fourier transform of something, we're taking, the second one, we're just taking, like, the Fourier transform, we're taking the inverse Fourier transform, and second one, the fourth one. So we got an impulse train. Yeah, just kind of looking at those. So I'll try and cover some of those in the ones that I that I hit today. So uh, I I really want to kind of touch on like getting the Fourier trans or the Fourier series fast whenever you have like sines and cosines or like a complex exponential. And I want to really stress Parseval theorem on that one. Um, and like, I kind of want to give an example where we're feeding a signal into some system and we're checking the output. So I think that is covered in four, but I haven't read that into detail yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's right. That's right. So I'll I'll cover four for that one. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and open one note here, and then I'll start. So yeah. So th those are some of my pages from last review. Oh yeah. Also, if like. Y'all need any additional like help or like want any other resources? I gave a pretty similar review on last Monday for Dr. Busso's class, so it, it covers a lot of the same material as this one. So yeah, if you want to hear me explain it again in a different way, then that's there for you also. But like, let's see, I should be able to write here now. Much better. So, right, I'm going to go ahead and look at, so, I think the first one that I'm going to tackle real quick is, like, say we have, like, a signal x of t, and then we got, like, cosine 2t plus sine, sine of, like, 4t plus like some complex exponential, like e to the j, uh, 60. Yeah, so like, um, the, the easiest way to get the Fourier, 
like the Fourier transform of this, the, the Fourier series, like notice that everything is periodic, so we'll be using the Fourier series representation. So like, like we'll get, we'll just tr use the identities that I was talking about earlier for the sine and cosine. So like remember that cosine of t is equal to e to the uh, jt plus e to the negative jt over 2. And for the sine term, we'll use the identity sine t is equal to e to the jt minus e to the negative jt. Yeah, so like, the only difference is that there's a j at the bottom, and they're on the sine. And we got a plus instead of a minus, and minus instead of a plus, vice versa. So like, yeah, all, all this tells us is that we can turn this into a exponential form pretty easily. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So x of t is equal to 1 half e to the 2t, j2t, plus 1 half e to the j negative 2t. So this is the cosine term. And then we also got sine term, so this is 1 over 2j, e to the j4t, plus 1 over minus 1 over 2j, e to the j4 t minus. And then we got this exponential here that notice that is already in the exponential form. So that's great for us. So we can get so this would be the exponential form of our Fourier series. So after that we just need to identify our coefficients. So like notice that all of these have the same frequency like all of these are integer multiples of of 2. So like this one is 1 times 2, this is 2 times 2 over here for the 4t's, this is 3 times 2 for the 6t. So like our omega naught is equal to 2. Uh, if you had just a bunch of arbitrary numbers here, so like I think this would be the least common uh, least common divisor, no wait, yeah, greatest common divisor of like all of the terms, so like it would be 2, 4, 6, yeah, and what you do is, yeah, after that, we got the Fourier series, so I'm just going to go ahead and write out those C terms, yeah, so like we got so c1 and c negative 1, so plus minus 1 would be 1 half, c plus minus 2 would be 1 over 2j, and c6 is equal to, no not c6, c3 is equal to 1. I'm just taking the coefficients in front here. Oh, wait, yeah, so this, so for positive 2, it's 1 half, for negative 2, it's negative 1 half, j. Two. Yeah, so we got that, and like, after that, so say we have this, and let's say we have this whole thing, and now what's the energy of like our x of t? So remember that the energy of something is given by like the integral over like the magnitude squared. So remember that the energy is given by the integral from negative infinity to infinity of the magnitude of our time domain function squared dt. So like this would be how would you this would be how you do it on the last exam like where you only had 
where you didn't have these notions of like uh, the frequency domain. So you couldn't use Parseval's theorem. Like we we weren't allowed to use like the frequency domain representation there. But like since we have uh, all of that now, like remember that Parseval's theorem tells us that uh, so this integral from negative infinity to infinity of x of t, I shouldn't erase that. Yeah, the magnitude squared dt is equal to 1 over 2 pi times the integral over the entire frequency domain, the magnitude of that squared. So what this gives us in effect is like we can just sum up all of these values for the energy. So this would just be like one half plus one half plus one one over two j. So it's like we could just sum and square everything here. So like, so e of x. So I'm gonna take one over two pi. But like we just go one half plus one half plus the magnitude squared. Remember that all of these are squared. Yeah. Squared. Yeah. 1 over 2 j. The magnitude of that would just be, it would be 1 half. Because 1 over j, remember that it's 1 over 2 j, or 1 over j. So I'm going to go ahead and try and write this up here. So remember that. Uh, 1 over j is equal to negative j and like so like this would be like negative square root negative 1 so like if you were to take the magnitude of this it would be 1 so like we get all those here so this would just give us a magnitude of 1 half plus 1 half for the other term and then we get 1 squared. And like, once you evaluate this whole string of summations, you'll get your energy. Yeah, this is this denotes energy. Uh, it doesn't say anything about expectation. But yeah, this energy. So that's how you do that for something that is already kind of in like a cosine and sine form. So we got that one. So I'm going to go ahead and try and tackle exercise two on yeah one of Fumigali's exams. So like uh, I think this is example four on his page. No wait, this is example five. Yeah, yeah. No, this is six. Yeah. Yeah, if, if like anyone's watching this in the future and they can't see the Discord, then look in on Fumagali's page and it's midterm two, example six. So like, we got all of these. So I'm gonna go ahead and write out the problem here. So we got, so what it says is to consider some time domain signal. So x is equal to u of negative t times e to the a t sine to negative naught t. Right, right. So like, then we got to find the Fourier transform. So what what is the Fourier transform now? I'm gonna try and write that out in blue. J omega. Yeah. Well, so what's what's this one? So what we'll do now is what my my first step is always to draw out the function. So like notice that the step function is flipped in time. So like it'll actually go from zero to be one from 
negative infinity to, to zero, and then this e time e to the at times sine. So like this is like a sine function, but like we got something that's decaying. So like it'd be like ooh, I'm gonna be more precise with that one. Yeah, so like, and that'll continue to infinity. So like, what we have here is, oh wait, hold on. This is actually reversed. Forgot about that. So we got a rising exponential. So it's like a truncated exponential that's like reverse. And like we got our sign there, and it just cuts everything off. So we got that. So this would be our time domain signal. So like, remember that the Fourier transform of a so like a multiplication of a Fourier transform would be the convolution in the frequency domain. So notice that this is e to the at times sine to the times sine of two omega t. So we got that. So like what we'll have is some Fourier transform of so whatever the Fourier transform of AT is, then we'll have to convolve it with whatever the Fourier transform of sine t is. Omega naught t two omega naught t. Yeah, so th this would be kind of freaky at first, but like, remember that the Fourier transform of sine is just two spikes, two delta functions. And we remember that if we have delta functions, if we take the convolute, okay, I'm going to write all my identities in red, just to not confuse them. So remember if we have like a delta function, and we convolve it with some other like function, then what that tells us is that we'll just get whatever that function was, so like here is a box, it's just moved over to wherever the delta, delta function is. So like, since this one is was at zero, then, wait, hold on, this is misleading. So like, if we had some delta function that was just out at, at anywhere, so like, I would say this is at A and then we convolve it with some baseband signal. So like, this has like some bandwidth. Then like, this convolution will just bring that signal over to A. Yeah, bring the center of it over at A. So, yeah, since we have two delta functions in the Fourier transform of like, this one, like we can really be looking at this convolution more like nicely so uh, then that kind of reduces the problem to getting the Fourier transform of this exponential function so like I'm gonna go ahead and do that integral real quick just to show y'all like, using the, the integral formula but a lot of this is just doing some like just a bit of calculus so so like let's see what was the Fourier transform of e to the at. So, that's the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the at, our function, times e to the j omega t dt. We're trying to integrate out our t. So like, what this is is that we'd have like the exponential at. So doing the algebra, we'll get the integral from um, so times t of wait, there's a negative. So this would be so negative t j omega minus a dt. 
So we got that. And so if you do this integral, you'll get like a delta minus a, or not t, omega. And it's like, I'm basically kind of taking it from those properties. Like remember that, uh, or from that table, this is a common integral that we'll have. So like we can take, remember from the table that the Fourier transform of an exponential is a delta function in the frequency domain. So what this tells us is that we'll get, we have some delta function, yeah, and the time domain, or we'll have a delta function convolved with two delta functions in frequency domain. So like, what this will tell us is that we'll get something that looks like this as our final results. So like, we'll get, remember that these two are centered at like omega and omega naught. Omega, omega naught, negative omega, yeah. And like, I think this one would be centered at A. Could be wrong on that, I'm trying to do this fast. So like, basically, we would move over this omega and omega naught over to A, so. So this would be omega zero plus A and omega zero plus A. Yeah, and I think that would be like your answer. Um, in my experience, uh, like professors have been really nice about like, like they they like it whenever you draw the picture, like. Um, it's not necessarily that you have to write it in in terms of like a case statement like writing it in that is algebraic form kind of like like obstructs the true meaning in in my opinion it's like when we're really like doing these problems we're thinking in terms of these pictures so whenever you're solving them try and think of it like oh hey i know the fourier transform of this one i know the fourier transform of this one so how do those interact? And what will those produce in our output? So like, I think that's the answer. Uh, let me go ahead and check that identity real quick. Yeah. E to the J, wait, hold on. Okay, E to the AT. That's not necessarily a complex number. Okay, yeah, A is a positive real coefficient. Yeah, so for this one, I would ignore this part. Uh, it's not actually a delta function. It was, I was misreading this, but it's an A. You'll have to do the integral formula. So like what I had here is like, the idea is there though. Like we'll just be moving over whatever the Fourier transform here is over to omega and omega naught. Um, let's see. So I'll try and do this integral instead of being lazy. Yeah, so we got the integral equal to e to the negative t over j omega minus a. So from negative infinity to infinity to negative infinity. And like if we evaluate this, this would go to zero at infinity. And like this one would go to negative infinity. So like, let's see. Is there a way you can make is there a way to make the line thicker? Oh yeah, yeah, on yeah. On the one note. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So like, um, let me 
Let me use this one. It doesn't seem to be all that much thicker. Let me see. What if I use this one? Yeah, so like. That's a bit thicker than before. Yeah, so that's that's the thickest that we got. So like, let's see. Uh, I I kind of wanted to hit some other questions, but like, we should be able to just do these integrals and then get the Fourier transform of e to the at, and then you'd convolve it with the Fourier transform of sine, and then remember that it produces copies at omega and omega naught. And then that's how you get that answer. So, like, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to another one. Yeah, so we got six. So, let's see, number three. So, what we got is the second derivative of. Oh, well, that's really thick, actually. What? <laughs> okay. So, if we got this one. Let's say we already have the Fourier transform. x to the j omega is equal to... But it's defined in terms of second derivative in frequency of this function, sine a omega over omega. So like, right, so the idea here is to get the Fourier, tra the inverse Fourier transform. So we need to get the inverse Fourier transform of this one. So what we'll do is remember some of those uh, Identity, though this Fourier transform properties, what tells us like a frequency derivative is just going to be a time, uh, a multiplication in time with the time time domain variable, the, the time variable. So like, yeah, so if we take the Fourier transform, the inverse Fourier transform of x of j omega, this is the inverse Fourier transform of d over d omega squared sine a omega over omega. And then remember that the Fourier transform with a derivative is going to just give us a time variable times the inverse Fourier transform Of whatever this sine omega over omega term is. So, uh, if y'all remember, this is actually the sinc function. Like this sine. Yeah, if we divide sine by omega, we we'll get a sinc function. And we know the Fourier transform of a sinc function. It's going to be a box. Yeah. So, like, we get a box. So, like. This is uh, what we'll get in, so if this is our frequency domain function, by duality we'd have the same Fourier transform in the time domain. So like, we'll go from a sinc function to some unit rectangle. So like, yeah, so we know that the Fourier transform here is just going to be, or the inverse Fourier transform of that sinc function is just going to be a box in time. And I think that that would have a... Yeah, so that would be T over A, I believe. So like, yeah, that's... This is our Fourier transform here for that second one. This is just a matter of using the, the table that you, you're 
you provided or the Fourier transforms that you, you should probably memorize. Like we should remember that the Fourier transform of a sinc function is a rectangle and the Fourier transform of a rectangle is a sinc function. So like you get something like this uh, modulus some like scaling factors or constants. Uh, I think you'd have like a factor of like 2 pi, 1 over 2 pi, just because like when we have scalar, or when we like have angular frequency omega is equal to 2 pi f, we usually like divide things out, like whenever we take the Fourier transforms, like the inverse Fourier transform has like a 1 over 2 pi term in front, yeah so like Yeah, so like, that's kind of what we get. Uh, final answer here. Um, it might be slightly off, but I'm going to go ahead and keep going, unless there's any questions. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the fourth one now. So remember that a continuous, so what we have is a continuous time signal, so x of t is equal to the sum of a bunch of delta functions, t minus k t big t. This is from infinity to negative infinity. Remember that this was had a, had a special name, uh, it's called like a pulse train and like a, bot a bunch of other names. So like, we got this. We know that the period is t, and what we want to get now is, so we have this signal, and then we're feeding it into some LTI function, some LTI system, so I'm gonna call it h, and from there, we want to get the output signal. Yeah, so we need to get y. So we get h, x, feed it into h, we get y. And we're also given the equation for h, which is, so h of t is equal to sine 5 pi t over tau over t, big T, over t. OK, so we got that. Uh, let's see. So we got a system. So this is, question has two parts. It wants you to get the average power of t, and it also wants to get the, the average power of y. And also, like, the, the function y itself. So, like, I'm going to go ahead and write that out. So, like, uh, we want to get power power of x of t, and we also want power of y, y of t, right? So like, all we got to do here is get the output now. So like, I'm going to go ahead and go over the first part, where we get the power of x. So like, the power of x is just going to be that integral formula, the, so like, so negative infinity to infinity of x of t squared, wait, that should be magnitude, magnitude squared dt. And since we're taking the power, this isn't going to have bounds from infinity to infinity, this is going to have bounds from the period to the negative period over 2, over 2, yeah. So we're just going to get the integral over one period of this function, since it's a power signal and not an energy signal. So like, remember that a power signal is something that has like an infinite amount of energy. It's typically going to be like periodic. All 
periodic functions cannot be energy signals. They're going to only ever be like power signals if we're going to measure them. So like, we got this, um, this pulse train, x of t. So like, I remember that all of these have one value of t. Yeah, one value is in here whenever. So all of them are spaced apart by t. So like, if we take any just individual uh, period here, all we'd get is one delta function whenever we, we take, we restrict this to one period of our function. So like, what this would mean is that we would get, so this integral power of t, or power of x, is going to be 1 over t times the integral from t to the next, so from t over 2 to negative t over 2 times the magnitude of the delta function squared dt. So like, uh, something to remember is that uh, the integral of like a delta function is equal to 1. Like, it's only ever going to be 1. This is, I'm going to write this in red because this is something that's important to remember. So like, so delta t, in the integral of delta t is equal to 1. It really doesn't matter what, uh, where you're integrating it over, like as long as you're capturing wherever this delta function lies, yeah, it's, it's zero value. So like, yeah, that, that's the key to this problem. So like, we got just the, so like, since this delta function is always going to integrate to 1, we know that it's just going to have like a power of 1, like, just because we're taking the average here, so like, 1 divided by, yeah, if we do this integral, we'll get t minus 2 plus t over 2, or t over 2 plus t over 2, so that will give us t, so t times t will go to 0, or t, t, t divided by t will go to 1. So like, and what we'll be left with is like this integral term of the delta function, so like, we'll just get 1. So that's our power, so that's, that's done, so this is a, this is a. So like, what we need to do for b now is we need to get the output the y function. <coughs> okay. So let's see. How do we do this one? So notice that the uh, so the easiest way to do this will probably be through the Fourier transform. Like when in doubt use the Fourier transform. <coughs> Unless like you see that there's a really easy way to do it with convolution, like Unless you see delta functions in whatever you're convolving, then use the Fourier transform. It's it's almost always easier. So like, remember that this is a sync function, <coughs> and we remember that the Fourier transform of a sync function is going to be a rectangle. It's going to give us a rectangle. So like, and this is going to have like the area, <coughs> or it's going to be a rectangle with, uh, I think, like 5 pi over t over 2t. 5 pi over 2t. Yeah, so like, that's our, our Fourier transform of h. Or maybe this should be in white. So like, that's our Fourier transform. So we got the Fourier transform of h. So now we need to get the Fourier transform of x. So y'all should remember that the Fourier transform of a delta function, uh, of a pulse train, a string of delta functions, it's periodic. So spike here, spike here, spike here, and these go off to infinity. So like pulse train here will give us a pulse train in the frequency domain. 
these are magnitude spectrums, by the way. Uh, remember that like the pulse train has a zero phase spectrum. <coughs> so like basically, we get a bunch of pulse trains everywhere. So like, what this would do is like, when we convolve, when we take the uh, Fourier transform here, remember the duality theory. So remember that the Fourier transform of so x convolved with h. So Fourier transform is equal to the multiplication of those two Fourier transforms. H. So like we know that. Or, wait. Like, we already know the Fourier transform of H. I, I just kind of got it here. And, like, this would have a value 1. <coughs> and, like, we got the Fourier transform here. And we got the Fourier transform of X. So, like, this one would be, like, X, probably. So, like, we would need to get the just the multiplication of these two. So, like, uh, remember the, the sifting property. Like, if we have a like a delta function so I'm gonna try and label these uh, yeah, con convolution theorem so if that one's a convolution theorem so we gotta get the sifting property of delta functions so like what that means is like if we have a, a delta function Like times <coughs> times like some function, so I'm gonna call it x of t. This is just going to give us the value of x of t at zero. And like if we were to generalize this further, it would be x where delta is like a shifted, so it's like moved over. Like this would give us. So if we multiply it by our x of t, then this will give us the value of x at a if you want that written out mathematically so like since we know the Fourier transform of h and we know the Fourier transform of x we can just uh, do this right here use the sifting property to get our final answer so like I'm gonna go ahead and try and write this out succinctly so like remember that the Fourier transform of x is a bunch of delta functions and like it, it has just some period of t and then our h function our system frequency response that's going to have a box and I believe that box has negative pi over 2t negative pi 5 pi over 2t and positive 5 pi over 2t so like we got these two so all we gotta do is just multiply them so like I'm gonna assume for a second that t is like much greater than 1 over whatever this value is. So like what this will capture at least is we're going to get just the delta function that's in the middle here and at whatever this value is. So if this is a value A this would be a delta function with the the value A. So like is there a y of t? Right, so like, wait, no, that's our y of omega, because we're in the frequency domain again. Omega, so, so this is y, y of omega. So like, that's great. So remember Parseval's theorem, 
y'all can use that to get the power of our x or our y. Like just remember that it's the so like so like power of y is like going to be the same as like the power of x. Like so it's just going to be two so one over two pi of the power of power of y the time domain. I believe that's correct. So like uh yeah, so this power is pretty easy. Remember that like this relationship that says that the integral of a delta function is 1. But since it's valued a here, then we get a value of a. So it would be like a over 2 pi is equal to power of t, y of t. Yeah, so that's what we got for our answer to the powers. Yeah. So I'm just going to try and copy. Yeah, so we had a power of 1 for a, power of a over 2 pi, where a is just the value of the, uh, the, our Fourier transform of h. So like, yeah, if you do all your algebra correctly, you should get something of this form. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all should probably know these identities a bit, a bit better right here. Uh, yeah. So, are there any questions on this one? Uh, it, it, there was a lot here. Uh, if no, I'm gonna go ahead and go on to the last one I was asked about. So we got yeah, so 2 through 5. So we got a continuous time signal x. So x of t is equal to sine t over alpha plus the step function u of t. Okay, and like we gotta get, and then we also have a system that gives us an output y that is x of t minus alpha squared times dx of t over dt squared. So, yeah, that's that. And what do we want to get? So we want to get the frequency response of x. Uh, we want to get the frequency response of our system, so we need to get h of j omega. Yeah, so like, um, what else? And the spectrum of the output. So like, we want to get y j omega. Right, so we got that. Cool, so this should be simple enough. We know that like x, we know that uh, y times y, if we feed it into like some LTI system, if we feed our input signal into an LTI system, then our y would be like our x signal involved with some h. So now the question is, what h? So like, the easiest way to look at this question is in terms of the frequency domain. So like, uh, just go ahead and taking, I'm just going to go ahead and take the Fourier transform of y. So y j omega is equal to Remember, so for your transform of x of t minus alpha squared d squared x of t, so dt squared. All right, so 
remember with linearity you can break up this uh, this Fourier transform so we can go f of x of t minus alpha squared times f of the second derivative of x dt squared right so we got all that and then so if we know the Fourier transform of x and we probably will so so x j omega call it x j omega so like we got that minus alpha squared and remember that the when you take a derivative of a time domain signal its Fourier transform will be like this j omega term like it's like the power of whatever order of derivative that you're taking so like we got j omega squared and then we got our x j omega again right right so we got that so what we got here is something that looks like this and so we can kind of factor out things so we'll get 1 minus alpha squared j omega squared times x of j omega but hey don't y'all remember that time domain convolution is equivalent to frequency domain convolute to frequency domain multiplication uh, yeah so we just multiply it times this so since we we have our x term out here then we can multiply it by what I'm getting at is that this over here on the left is our h j omega that's the Fourier transform so like what we need to do after this is just take the inverse Fourier transform of whatever's in here so like uh, you can do this with like linearity and yeah just doing all of the this is like just a linear function so like it shouldn't be that hard to integrate so like so that's your h and we already have y. It's like, all we need for y is to get the Fourier transform of x. So like, what is the Fourier transform of x? So like, we just need to get... So x j omega is equal to the Fourier transform of sine t over alpha plus u of t. over alpha plus uh, u of t. So like we got the Fourier transform here. So this would be two delta functions of minus a. So it's I think it's a plus delta of t plus a. Let me write that a little better. So ugly delta. T plus A over over two. Two J. Two J. Yeah, uh, you might want to check up on these uh, identities. I'm just going off of memory for right now. And then we know that the uh, Fourier transform of a Step function is a, I think it's like a j omega times like delta. Uh, yeah. So since that's x, so like assuming all of this is right, we would just plug in that expression here into our y, and then we got our spectrum for y. So like I thing that addresses everything for this question. So we got h and yeah this one's h right here and then we got y which is just plugging this whole expression into here. So like I think that's about it on this question. Um, 
yeah, let's see. Anything else uh, that I want to hit? It's like, we have about four minutes left. Uh, I've covered a few of the requested questions. Yeah, so, so like, let's see. Um, so we, we've covered, using Parseval's theorem pretty extensively, we've used the integral theorem. So like, uh, let's see, one, one other thing. So like, one other question that might be asked, uh, let's see, so if we have like a, a system that's given by like h, h of t is like some box, some rectangle, then like, uh, what we could do is like, we will get, we'll shift it over, uh, we'll get h of t minus tau, it's shifted over. So like, what we'll want it, so what we want now is for some input signal, so so given x of t, we want to get y of t. So like, remember that we just use the property that x of, so remember that h, so the Fourier transform of h of t minus tau is going to be this multiplication of this complex exponential term times the original Fourier transform, which is just going to be this exponential term times our, our sinc function. Yeah, so like, that, that's about it on uh, I'm trying to think of what we missed. Um, Y'all might want to cover some more questions over Fourier series, just because uh, that, that's one other thing that we didn't hit in these questions. If y'all want a more extensive, uh, if, if y'all want more like examples of me solving problems, uh, check out the review for Buso. I, I covered a lot of Fourier series questions on that one. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I have a lot here. Uh, other than that, uh, good luck on your exam. Um, check out my, yeah, my notes are posted if y'all haven't uh, seen those yet. Uh, they're sitting in the IEEE Discord, but also I'll be posting it as a comment on YouTube whenever this gets finished. So, like, that's great. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, good luck on your exams. Yeah, for, this is a hard course, so, like, uh, just, I just want to reaffirm, like, this isn't, it, it's not an easy course for anyone, so, yeah, uh, we're about, like, exactly out of time, so, yeah, y'all have a nice night now, so, unless there's any other questions, I, I have a few minutes, but, yeah, if there's anything else, uh, at Discord. Well, if there isn't anything else, uh, yeah, y'all have a nice night.